Or no, I guess I can let me know. This is plugged in, so I can, yeah, as long as you're so I guess let me know. Okay. 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 So my name is Aquia, and I will be starting us off today. And we'll be going over how anti-oppression means anti-violence and how anti-violence means anti-oppression. We cannot get rid of violence without an anti-oppression focus. And we'll be going over some um, ground, um, ground information, providing some context as to what we mean by oppression and how this intersects with violence. And then we will transition into what this looks like on campus. So when we're thinking of supporting communities, what does this look like to have 
a student-centered approach. And so I am joined with um, my co-presenter, Elena, who will talk in a little bit. So I really appreciate you being here. And then after the presentation part, we'll go into a panel. Um, our panel is comprised of students and Women Resource Center staff who would again go into more detail as to what do we mean um, when we're trying to support college students who are survivors here on campus. So when we think of oppression, we have to think of how power and privilege manifest. We each hold power and privilege in a number of ways due to the identities that we hold and how these identities intersect. Our current society awards individuals, groups, and communities more privilege due to the ways that their identities intersect. That has manifested in many ways, including throughout history and throughout laws. And there are a number of ways that that privilege is validated. So power can be used by taking those privileges and using them in a way that can make people feel or be less than human. This can take place in an interpersonal interaction. So for example, if you are um, aware of what microaggressions are, but this can also look like in the form of discriminatory laws, policies, xenophobia, for example. So if you look on the image of your left, my left, um, or sorry, I can't think of, but the first image, uh, we see some of the various ways that um, categories make up a person. The ways that they intersect speak to someone's unique identity and their experiences. If we take this idea to a larger context or framework, so then looking at the sociological model on the right, we can see how top-down oppression affects an individual and the ways that their identities intersect. Using this model, we can see how policies and systems that were created were established by individuals who have the greatest amounts of privilege. The effects of these policies have a top-down effect on how an individual can live and be. So for example, if we think of just how a few years ago, not everyone was able to marry the person of their choosing. And so we think of that as a systemic law that is um, on the policy systems and society level. That has a trickle effect on how an individual is able to be and operate in their everyday life. So how does that affect um, their attitudes, their behavior, their health, and how does that affect their interactions in the various communities that they are a part of? So that's just an example of how uh, top-down oppression operates and how that intersects with power and privilege, depending on the ways that our identities intersect. So then applying this concept of power and privilege to the idea of sexual violence that relate to the various ways that they experience oppression. Remember that oppression is the burden that someone with less privilege and power due to their identities experience on a regular and consistent basis. Because of these identities that we hold, the oppression that we experience are unique. So for example, I am a black woman. My experience at that intersection is unique. So how I may respond to any of these forms of violence that's on this diagram is unique and valid because I'm experiencing that through my own lens of oppression. Also note that there are things that I may not understand because there are identities that I do not hold, that they are not a part of my identity. That does not mean that anyone else's experiences as it relates to this type of violence is any less valid. Every reaction and response to trauma from a survivor of violence is valid. There is no wrong way to experience trauma because survivors experience trauma at the intersections of their oppression. The circles outside of the center are considered norms. And so this model is called Revisioning the Sexual Violence Continuum. The oppressions that are at the center are what exists in society that allow these norms to continue and manifest. So for example, the same forces in our society that allow sexist jokes to occur are the same forces that allow the darker colored hues on this diagram to occur. 
So at the basis of all of this are oppressions. <laughs> oppressions that affect people based on their gender, their race, their class. So for example, sexism allows sexist jokes to happen. So when it comes to supporting survivors of violence, we need to make sure that we are showing up and recognizing all parts of a person, which includes acknowledging the oppressions that they face. So then let's take another look as to how this shows up in sexual intimate partner and domestic violence. So another example, this is the power and control rule. Power can be used in manipulative and nuanced ways. It can be used as a way to make a person feel less than human. This is done through forms of control. For example, setting up an environment physically, emotionally, financially, or spiritually, where a person cannot fully operate as their authentic and full selves. When we think of someone committing a form of violence, they are, um, when we think of someone committing this form of violence, they are committing violence towards someone, um, towards a survivor or a victim, and they're viewing that person as less than human. So for example, if I truly view someone as my equal, as someone who is a full human being, I will not commit violence towards that person. If there's even an inkling in my being that views a person less as less than me, then how I talk to that person, how I address that person, how I um, cause harm to that person will show up in some form or fashion. This can be done through overt ways, but this can also be done through covert ways too. So what has society told me all along that I am someone who is better than others? How is that validated through my everyday experiences? How do I exercise that? Those are some questions that someone with great amount of power and privilege do not necessarily have to ask themselves. So if we keep this in mind when we look at this will, this shows some specific ways that control manifests in these types of violence. There are a number of ways, or excuse me, there are a number of a different kinds of wills that have a more inclusive approach. So I acknowledge that this is more of a gendered way to view power and control as it relates to sexual and domestic violence. But one of the key points that I would like you to take away from this is that power and control operates in very nuanced, covert, and overt ways. So the last model that I would like to share with you is called the Sasha model. And this model was created by Kalima Johnson. And Kalima wanted to understand the specific ways that Black women oppression impact their specific healing journeys and their access to resources and care. We don't necessarily have the time to go deep into what this model is saying, because it's saying a lot. However, there are some key takeaways to um, take from this model. So when we are trying to understand how to support a specific community of survivors, who best to let us know what they need than the survivors themselves? The best way to provide care and resources to survivors is to one, listen to them, their stories, their specific needs for support. There is no one who can best describe what they need than from the community themselves. By listening to survivors' voices and the communities that they are a part of, we can best understand how they are impacted by violence and what are the best resources to provide. So in this particular example, Kalima was able to do research and realize what were the specific forces that impacted Black women, how did that prevent them from accessing certain forms of care, and then she was able to use that research to create resources that Black women found more accessible. So now we'll talk a little bit about the various types of gender, or excuse me, sexual and domestic violence, and then focus on how to best support survivors on campus. So as we learn on how to best support college survivors, keep in mind some of these takeaways from these different models and frameworks and how we can apply an anti-violence and anti-oppression approach. We have to counter the norms that allow power and control to happen and treat human beings as less than they are. 
And we have to pay attention to what student communities are telling us in terms of what they need with resources and with support. So now I'm passing the mic to Elena who will um, go deeper into this. And I invite Elena to introduce herself as well. Hi, my name is Elena, and I'm a senior at UI, and I'm also an intern at the Y. Um, so I'm going to speak about forms of unhealthy and abusive behavior. So unhealthy and abusive behavior comes in many different forms, including sexual assault, sexual exploitation, and sexual harassment. What all these forms have in common is a lack of consent. Consent is a clearly given yes, not just the absence of a no. Verbal and nonverbal abuse, when consent is being given, should match. And now we're going to speak about forms of relationship abuse. So relationship abuse is far reaching and is comprised of many different types. Um, however, to keep things simple, it is broken down into five forms. Physical, financial, emotional, slash psychological, technological, and sexual. Physical relationship abuse ranges from hitting or punching to confining someone to a space. Financial abuse is exemplified by forbidding a partner to work or paying for things with the expectation of a return favor. An example of emotional and psychological abuse is threatening to harm oneself to keep a partner from leaving. Sexual abuse is exemplified by taking or sending sexual or naked pictures without consent. Dating violence can take a lot of different forms and it can be hard for survivors of relationship abuse to recognize some of these behaviors as abusive for many reasons. This among other reasons is why it's important to be understanding and supportive of survivors. Now onto the impact of assault. So the impacts of sexual assault can vary greatly, but many of them can fall into three categories, physical, emotional, and social. Physical impacts of sexual assault include STDs or STIs or sleeping issues. Emotional impacts of sexual assault include PTSD and emotions like fear, shock, or self-blame. Social impacts of sexual assault include difficulty trusting others and isolation. Survivors may not experience every impact or other category of impact mentioned. Each survivor is uniquely affected. Anything that I've stated or that a survivor experiences is, not, is a natural response. Healing from a sexual assault can also look very different for survivors, and there is no right way for a survivor to heal. Next, I will speak about FICARE. FICARE is a student led program that stands for First Year Campus Acquaintance Rape Education. It is a discussion on campus sexual assault that is very participatory. We recognize that most sexual assault is perpetrated by an acquaintance of the survivor. While most conversations about sexual assault focus on ways people can protect themselves from it, BICARE is a program that is centered on bystander intervention and problematic behavior for those around us. This program is mandatory for all first year and transfer students. BICARE is broken down into sections about sexual assault, consent and coercion, the role of drugs and alcohol in, in assault, effects of sexual assault and victim blaming, forms of unhealthy and abusive behavior, bystander intervention, supporting survivors, and resources and activism. And then for another example of how we support students on campus, I'm going to pass it on to Mariana, who is a Women Resources Center staff person, who will talk a little bit more. So please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, all, my name is Mariana, and I'm a confidential advisor at the Women's Resources Center. So, out of curiosity, can you please raise your hand if you've heard of a confidential advisor and know what that means? Okay. Okay. So, under something called the Clary Act, college campuses are required to have confidential advisors on campus. And so, what confidential advisors are supposed to do is help students in a moment of crisis who experience any type of sexual misconduct. And so some of that crisis intervention work is, you know, helping students get access to different types of like resources. So whether they have like any kind of like financial, academic, medical, or housing issues, even employment issues, um, as well as like um, helping them become like acquainted with like their different reporting options, um, whether that's within the police or through the campus. Um, um, a campus uh, alternatives available to them too, with different procedures and doing like safety planning. Um, so a confidential advisor really meant to like provide a safe space for survivors to talk about their experiences and navigate any kind of like resources that they might need. 
So under the cross placement model, um, uh, it's really meant to provide like more spaces for students to access um, uh, confidential advising. Um, so by being placed in the cultural centers, um, so BNAP on Mondays 1 to 4 p.m. and La Casa from 10.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., it provides the students a chance to go um, have confidential advising in spaces where they feel comfortable because some of the feedback that students gave the university was that they didn't necessarily feel comfortable going to the Women's Resources Center, especially like if they didn't have any kind of involvement or really like you know where the center was at. Um, and by partnering with cultural houses too, and being visible with the students who work there, there's a lot of opportunities to do collaborative work. So some things like that happen, um, it's like students have any kind of like ideas that, um, of like programming that they want to see or like workshopping related to like sexual or, or romantic relationships. Um, I'll partner with students to help them come up with like any like uh, workshop idea that they might uh, have for the center. So it's really about like focusing on the needs of the students and helping them with the student-centered approach to develop. Um, so yeah, uh, above on the slide um, is a description of like where we're located and our, our satellite hours and um, ways to contact us. <laughs> Thank you. And then now we'll go into our panel. Um, so Casey is going to come and moderate um, and we look forward to hearing from our panelists. It's a really hard job and it's emotionally draining. And I just want to say publicly that we appreciate you and everything that you all do as professionals, but also as individuals who are actualizing Which gets into my first question, which is what are some of the ways as college students that you or on college campuses that you see your you interacting with survivor supports? Uh, how do you see yourself as college students interacting with these systems? Um, and what are some other ways that you, you do that work? So, like, I would just say that we just went over the campus section of this conduct survey yesterday. Um, and we found that for students that do report any kind of misconduct, they are significantly more likely to report to a friend or a peer than they are to a professional. So, in a lot of ways, you are the frontline folks who are helping survivors. What are some of the ways that that? Um, plays out in their everyday lives as well. Um, I think I'll go ahead with one. My name is Crystal. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Crystal. I'm a good few students studying political science, so it's a pastor to do it right. And so I like to emphasize the like the big group part because I've been here for almost five years. So this means I have seen the transition of like how life was before like. COVID on campus and during. And during my five years, um, I feel just like the way the person that I am is very like vocal, outgoing, very social. Um, and I have been able to establish these different relationships with different um, like cultural centers and people in general in their classes or even our that I'm involved in. And you know, like and, and like a lot of people have like come to like come to me and told me like this has happened with my group. And it's usually in regards to like, sexual misconduct, sexual assaults. And it's hard, right? Because you're having these conversations with people you establish at least a basic friendship with. Um, and, and so one of the things that I usually do where I'm just like, hey, these are the different systems, these are the things that you can do. I've 
never like this is what you should do, right? So it's more about listening to them um, and figuring out, you know, the different resources that are available here on campus. And so one of the different resources that are available is obviously the Women's Research Center. And so I tell them like, hey, they have a confidential advisor. So basically, if you're able to go to them, um, explain any sexual misconduct to whatever person you're most comfortable with, without any repercussion of being um, like having to report, right? Um, because confidential advisors are the only people on campus that are not mandatory reporters. And so once we navigate that small different um, conversation and they meet with them, um, they are aware of the different um, avenues that they're able to take. Um, and so being a minoritized student on campus, there's some people, there's like certain systems that you don't want to interact with at all. Like, I personally wouldn't want to interact with the University of Illinois Police Department for various reasons. And um, how do you navigate? How do you get accountability to that? And how do you get justice in your own way, right? Um, and definitely knowing the different resources that the Women's Resource Center has helped um, with getting some type of help for the survivors. Um, but I call my friends as well. Um, and so, yeah, like just knowing the different resources on campus, but outside the local community as well, as they have the racist hotline. Um, yeah, I'll see what I'm doing. Does anybody else want to answer that? I think children. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Alexis. I'm a junior. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a manager of the year at the university. Um, I think one we'll talk about ways to support survivors. If it's someone coming to you, it's really important to just um, show them that you're there for them. I know that sounds kind of basic, but I feel like that is kind of the best way. Um, making yourself as a person who can be there for them when they're making a difficult phone call, or the person that Maybe you do want to afford it in the place, being that person to ride with them. You know, just being there for them in little ways, um, checking in on them, um, just a little ways to show you that you care. With a lane of time. We want to sort of decide for them to be the first ones to not have to really experience sexual misconduct. So I think one thing that I always try to reiterate is that um, during sexual misconduct, power and autonomy and control is taken away from the survivor. And so it's really, really important in the aftermath of sexual violence and when you're supporting a survivor, try to give them that control and power back. And if you can do that, like, Person's head is like supporting them and offering them resources, but at the same time, not urging them to support any participation in any resources and not going to a resource. So I think being there for them is not in any way like forcing them to take any certain steps, but supporting them to each step. And so I'm just listening to them. I'm just showing them the same thing. Um, I really like what they're doing in this way. And one big thing that really stands out to me is um, letting us survivor take their time. I think there's this urgency. We added action to this stuff, and it just doesn't need to be like that. I think we need to realize that it's okay if um, something happens a day later or 20 years. Um, people deserve their justice for this period of time. And um, I think that's one thing that the campus is great at. I think the fact that you're RAs are made of course, everyone around you is made of course. You really don't have space to, to take your time and decide and when, when is your time to get your justice is such a silly word. Not just a silly word, but it's so, it's an interesting word, I'll say. But it's, people don't respect the fact that people need time to take time. A lot of this person, resources really 
as everyone said, research is so important, but also being like, hey, this isn't what you need right now, which is the current, you just need time away, you need time to figure out what you need to do for your plants or little plants. Be there for them. I think people don't realize um, when you force someone who is fond of things, um, when you force someone to do to do what is expected of them when they walk through something, that is a lot of good for them. Um, that can be really confusing, but it is a way because you're you're like, well, I often hear I've heard a couple of times it's like, well, if you didn't say anything, that's your fault. And it's like it's not right. Um, I'm also sexy, so I'm aware of that trauma. So I'm not, I'm not like, you know, terrified or anything. I'm just not saying anything for them. But like, trauma, when you return with trauma, it is almost just as bad as what you're doing. So it's just so important to bring a little bit of that. And I feel like I, those are just little things that are coming up for me. Uh, this is really going off the call. I'll miss it because that's the thing that's really great. Research really good for your current time. It's so simple. Hi, I'm Brian. So I'm actually a graduate student in the history department. Um, before coming to graduate school, I worked in the world of domestic violence intervention in Chicago, working specifically with immigrant communities and people experiencing homelessness. Um, so my experience thinking about undergrad is actually a different institution, but I think we know there are a lot of commonalities across the institutions. And like everyone has said, um, as in an individual level, right? Like it's really important to believe someone when they tell you what they've been through. I've seen a lot of situations where best friends don't believe that person, and that's very harmful. Um, and then tying this into the idea of like anti-oppression work, what I want to emphasize is like a lot of survivors are experiencing that interpersonal violence uh, in sense, but it's also institutional violence, right? Because if you think about how sometimes not always reporting is framed as like the solution or the means to like deal with the issue, the reality is, and I'm saying you know, that's myself not affiliated with any part of this university, like that the institution also can inflict forms of trauma through the process of questioning, through the questions they ask at the institution. I was trying to ask questions like. Well, is this person normally flirtatious? What was she wearing? Um, extending the investigation process for many, many months. So I think the important thing is to recognize these institutions are also rooted in histories of oppression and how someone is going to experience going through those institutions will also have to do with their parts of their identity. And so when a friend means something, it might be as simple as, hey, I need food and I don't want to go to the dining hall because my abuser or the perpetrator is there. Or, hey, I don't have clean clothes and I can't get out of bed. Can I borrow socks? Can you help me with laundry? I love the um, line earlier that everyone experiences trauma in their own way and survivors know what they need. So, listen to what they need and remember like, there are multiple levels of violence happening at the institutional level and at the individual level. So we need to support people with what they say they need. Thank you. Thanks, Rianca. And actually, thank you for doing my job for me. Um, that transitions really well into my next question, which is sort of thinking about how we're in control, thinking about the case models and institutionalized oppression. How do you see that playing out at, in this community, whether that's in university institutions or just within? sort of student-led institutions that you're a part of, how do you see power and control that model impacting your lives as women on campus and particularly as women of color? Um, I think for power and control, one thing that's really big in our culture right now is like consensus and like the idea that your partner has to call you 20 times a day for that to actually love you. Mm -hmm. So just bringing jealousy and things like that that's kind of love. Um, and it's, I see that like in real relationships, I also see it in the as well. But I don't think that we can definitely change. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like there's just like the idea of like 
the entitlement to like other people's time and their body and things like that. So just the act of possessiveness is what I see our country. And so three of the um so, um, I think one thing that I really think about is the, um, sorry, one thing that I think about is um, our just, even just basic, um, the students coming in, freshmen, um, you know, why not? Um, just how you have to interact with our teachers, sometimes in the keyboard. Uh, I'm, so I'm a junior, uh, third year student, and so I was literally thinking. I really have heard something that I've had with my freshman guy. I'm not allowed to be a person in a piece of to another person on the on our, what is it called, our, our like their group. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, so instead of saying anything, I just kept this flag to they were wrong. And um, that's, a, that's a power thing. Um, that, that most definitely would have to get this as power. Even though that person was a student as well, they still have power, and you don't even think about how power plays out in our day and actions. Even in the things that we choose to participate in, my my own okay, or our side. Even with our teachers, I have some um, mental disorders that are related to me and that type of thing. So, and sitting in class sometimes is so hard. They just trying to express what you like. I don't know what words you said today. Right? Like even without having those disorders and disabilities, it's like sitting there and you kind of feel bad because it's like you're disappointing this person that probably doesn't care that much about you. I just say it like that. But it's like, it's just even at this level like that, we don't even think about how much, how much control we give to the people in our lives, even people that are our age, even people who's professors. Sometimes one thing that always happens to me is when I get a professor or a TA that's like, no, I fully believe where and how society is and how I have this power looks like other and it's just me to why that I think that's the word switch that power over me. And um and it's finding that realization that it's like you can say it's people really struggle with that kind of size. America's really something we talk about race all the time, but when you get to class it's, it's even worse. Yeah, like and especially when you're talking about well, I had a white teacher who was like, I fully understand what you're doing, John. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah, you don't. You, you sound goofy. Like, you have no idea what I'm going for. And, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. The, like, oh, she's on high um, but, but, like, people don't realize how, people don't even realize the same, oh, I understand where you're coming from. And also, we have more of, like, taking the power of this um, So, as it comes, that's experiencing this type of violence, some type of oppression, and some, you know, something like that. Um, it's, it's like a it's like way to minimize your, your situation. Yeah. Right? And that's like, that's how they take the power away from you as a result of just saying, like, I understand what you're talking about. Like, well, you're not. You're like, who are middle aged white women teaching this, this class about like class of oppression? And it's just like, what what are you you know like what what about you um is actually aligned with other than being the oppressor other than getting from me being oppressed right and so <laughs> but yeah it's like I just had to go to the teacher I didn't do this I was like I was like what are you why are you sitting here having this conversation so I'm talking to you we're sitting here having this conversation that's like you don't even realize it. You're, 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 you're not even realizing how well you're tokenizing me, and then you're not even looking at the fact that you're literally not even looking at the full circle of conversation because you're so based in one thing. Oh, um, first of all, these students aren't learning something, and now I'm sitting here trying to explain it because, unfortunately, for black folks, there's this idea of black guilt, but there's also like really strong guilt moms. It's like we have to, we think we have to teach everyone something. I don't have to teach anyone anything. That's why I'm not concerned. I can sit down. They say it's being nice. Those are just little ways of reminders. Those are little reminders. And when it does sometimes when you get help, it's not available to you in a effective way. Because you'll always experience a lot of pressure sometimes. We'll come back to that, but switching gears just a little bit. So Pfizer is one resources on campus, right? Or one way for students to find out about resources on campus. 
what, what about fiber do you think is important or empowering for students? But also, like, what else, where do you see that we need to do more? Especially those of you who are fiber facilitators, what are some of the conversations that get started in fiber that you know we need to do outside of that space? <laughs> um, I think my fear is an interesting um, workshop simply because it is discussion based and really aim to get students engaged when we're talking about. Um, and students are really more comfortable talking to their peers um, in a student led discussion. So that's what I like to talk about. Um, I really think we can have the resources in the workshop. Um, we really think on um, just ways to like build healthy relationships, but I think um, we could do more with that. Like, we have specific workshops just for um, healthy relationships and how to navigate, um, navigate those relationships. So, um, <laughs> I guess just going into what that actually looks like. Um, so yeah, I'm I also, I also feel like a lot of great conversations are started in my care, but it's only a two hour program. And so we really can't like delve deep into a lot of these questions that don't have like yes or no answers or don't aren't really that the point. And I think there's a lot of like Both of you. <laughs> 